It's a camouflage. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Snakes Are Everything. So happy to be here. I would like to thank the library at Western New Mexico University for letting us use one of their meeting rooms to do this. And I'd also like to welcome Mike Cardwell for being with us this morning. Hello, Mike. Good morning, Melissa. Thanks for inviting me. Nice. It's so nice to see you. So um, for those of you who don't know about Advocates for Snake Preservation, I'm going to say just a few quick words. I think probably most of you do, but um, Advocates for Snake Preservation is an organization that is working to change how people view and treat snakes. I'm Melissa, I'm the executive director and one of the co-founders along with Jeff Smith. Um, yeah, and we do a variety of educational work online through our website and social media and also through online presentations such as this series called Snakes for Everything where we have other people on to talk about um, cool things about snakes. <laughs> um, it's pretty varied. So Mike Cardwell is our guest today. And um, I don't remember how long we've known Mike, but a while. Um, Mike is um, former law enforcement and got an interest in rattlesnakes and specifically Mojave's um, and did really the first, like there's been a lot of work done on Mojave's, but mostly related to their venom. Um, but yours was the first to like look at ecology and behavior right. and just see what they're like, you know, for them instead of just, um, you know, I think the venom comes from an interest of like how they affect people, which is a lot of times how we think about snakes. Um, exactly. And, you know, as you will learn today, if you don't already, Mojave's are the source of a lot of myths and legends, um, mis the most misunderstood amongst a group of very misunderstood animals. And to help clear that up, besides doing presentations like this, Mike has also written a book on Mojave rattlesnakes. Um, <laughs> and we will provide a link to where you can pick that book up on the episode page for this issue. Um, yeah, and I wanted to say a couple personal connections that we um, have with, with Mike through the organization is I think uh, how a lot of people first got to know us and our work studying rattlesnake behavior was through using um, time-lapse cameras. And we got that idea from Mike like 10, 11 years ago. It's been a while now, but yeah. He introduced us to these old friends, <laughs> which we're not, we've upgraded a little bit. These time-lapse cameras that were made to watch plants grow, but actually do a really good job with studying rattlesnakes, especially in the spring when they're not moving very fast. They've been awesome. So we have Mike Cardwell to thank for that because that's how we were searching for a way to monitor behaviors with cameras. And he told us about these and oh, wow. We, and we've all now seen some awesome things with those. Um, and another connection that the organization has with Mike is one of our big um, advocacy victories was with a, um, a bill in Arizona that would have um, lightened the ban on shooting firearms in cities. Um, it, was, it would have created an exception if you were shooting at a snake or rodents. And Arizona is a very gun-friendly state. Um, we were really, you know, I mean, we tried to stay hopeful, but we, we really didn't think that we were going to be able to, to win that fight. And the day that the vote came down, we had had our supporters and friends write letters about why this is not a great idea to have people shooting off guns in cities for any reason. Um, and one of the, the person who ended up like making the deciding vote in our favor read a letter that one of our people sent in, and that was a former law enforcement that was also a rattlesnake biologist, and that was Mike Cardwell. And she, that senator, read that on the floor, and I'm pretty sure that is that is why we won. So awesome! Thank you for that. And now I'm going to turn it over to you. <laughs> uh, thanks, Melissa. Um, let me make some screen adjustments here on my end. Um, that was a great introduction, Melissa. Thank you so much. Uh, it's 
it's really great to to be invited to talk about my passion as melissa mentioned um, everybody should see my title slide is that right melissa just give me a nod nope it's still just you it's not screen sharing yet oh okay second So hang on, there we go. Okay, should have it now? Yep. Yep. All right, we'll get rid of the floating bar. Now we good? Okay, so again, thanks Melissa for the invitation. As I said, it, it's always a pleasure to um, be able to talk about my passion. I've been interested in snakes since I was a little boy in Los Angeles. Um, and as I grew up and my family moved from LA out to the Mojave Desert, um, I became familiar with rattlesnakes and then specifically Mojave rattlesnakes because in the, in the Mojave Desert of Southern California, for the most part, there are no diamondbacks. And uh, Mojave's down in the flat desert valleys were the only large rattlesnakes. There were sidewinders there and there were speckled rattlesnakes in the hills, but Mojave's were the common larger rattlesnake. And people just had all sorts of crazy ideas about um, snakes in general, of course, and Mojave's in particular. So we're going to some of that, but I'm not gonna spend our time together talking just about Mojave rattlesnakes. And after all, we're talking about snakes being misunderstood, but I am gonna kind of concentrate on rattlesnakes. Um, so, you know, we've all heard uh, some of these myths and I'll get into them in a few minutes. Um, who hasn't heard that baby rattlesnakes are more dangerous than adults? Um, you know, Mojave's are often called Mojave greens because um, many of them have a greenish tint. Um, but no matter what field guide you, you read or even references to Mojave rattlesnakes in some technical journals, always make some comment about them being the deadliest or the most toxic of, of rattlesnakes or of all snakes. Um, but there's always some mention about how uh, horribly deadly they are. Um, and you hear people all the time talk about rattlesnakes being aggressive um, towards people and attacking people. And you hear some crazy stories I won't go into that are just on their face crazy. But um, what I really want to do to start with is give you a little hint about what we know about rattlesnakes um, behavior when they're not being bothered by a person, when they're not all riled up and defensive and rattling and, and um, worried about their own survival. What do they do day in and day out? You know, what are the private lives of, um, of rattlesnakes like? Well, you know, it may surprise um, some of you to learn that, you know, rattlesnakes are actually shy, secretive, cryptic, of course. Um, they spend an awful lot of their time doing what this Western Diamondback is doing, and that is coiled up in what we call a pancake coil. And in this case, um, in this position, they're usually hunting. Rattlesnakes are uh, ambush hunters. They don't, uh, for the most part, they don't actively pursue their prey like some other snakes do. They'll find a spot where they think it's likely that they'll encounter a, a prey animal that'll wander by, either a rodent or sometimes a lizard or a bird. Um, and then they sit still and they wait for the prey animal to come along. Um, because they're, they're cryptic and, and they're shy. Remember, a rattlesnake, most of the rattlesnakes that we see weigh less than a pound. A big rattlesnake may weigh a couple of pounds. Um, but the last thing they want is an encounter with something as large as we are, something that's 200 times their body mass. You know, rattlesnakes bite for two reasons, either to kill something to eat or to defend themselves. And they get good at feeding themselves, killing things to eat, but they don't have to bite defensively very often. And when they do, I've come to think of that as a, a, a tactic of last resort by a panicked animal. Um, and that's the last thing they want to do because one, they've been discovered, if it's a predator like a bobcat or a coyote or a raptor, uh, if they don't have 
uh, a refuge they can get into, brush or a, a rodent hole nearby, um, they are, are often on the menu for that predator. So they do their best to avoid confrontation with things that they don't think they're going to eat. But as I mentioned, most of the larger rattlesnakes, um, rattlesnake species are rodent predators. They eat rodents. Um, this is a tiger rattlesnake swallowing a desert um, pocket mouse. And, you know, this snake has probably laid in wait like the diamondback you just saw. Pocket mouse comes along and the rattlesnakes generally with the rodents tends to strike and release, let the little rodent run off and die. Because rodents, of course, have those big incisor teeth and they can do a lot of damage if the snake hangs on. So they have this chemical means of incapacitating prey. They let the prey run off and die and then they have to scent trail it. So I'm going to show you a video now that was provided by Ruan Clark. And it's one of many videos that he and his students have made. And um, like everybody else that sees it, I think you'll be pretty amazed. And you can find more videos like this at ninjarat.org. You can see the uh, web address in the lower left-hand corner of the screen there. But this is taken at night by a night vision camera. So using infrared, uh, it's totally dark. This is a wild rattlesnake, wild kangaroo rat. And you're gonna see a remarkable video, as I mentioned, but there's three things I want you to, to look for. One, the reaction time of the kangaroo rat. Notice how close the snake gets with the strike before the rat reacts and is still able to avoid the strike. Second, notice what the snake does while the rat is in the air. This snake has learned, I don't know if he's actually learned it by experience or he knows it intuitively, but he knows that that rat is in the air and might land on it. So you'll see how he's prepared if that happens. And thirdly, look how much of the snake's length he stretches out in the strike for this kangaroo rat. So let's watch the, the video. It's in slow motion, of course. Remember, this is totally dark. Look at the snake now with the rat in the air. Of course, the rat does not land on the snake in this case and is gone. But amazing reaction time by the kangaroo rat. The snake clearly is prepared if the, land, if the rat happens to land back on him. In this case, it didn't. And third, you know, we talk about defensive strikes by rattlesnakes being usually a quarter of their length or maybe a third of their length. Where you can see this snake is stretched out probably over half his length. And if you watch some of the other videos on Rulon's website, you'll see Mojaves and sidewinders that extend their body pretty much their whole length trying to grab something to eat. That's not typical for defensive strikes, but it's good to know they can strike that far um, when you're trying to decide what's a safe distance to stay away from, from these animals. Well, my video is not advancing here. Sorry about that. Let me start it again. So this is a, a Mojave rattlesnake that's killed a round-tailed ground squirrel. You see him searching back and forth, tongue flicking. Um, he's scent trailing that squirrel. And this was a, a September morning, about 10 o'clock. No, not a cloud in the sky, so it's pretty warm. Once he finds a squirrel, he's going to start swallowing it. And snakes, snakes tolerate being cool a lot better than they do being too hot. Getting too hot can be pretty quickly lethal for them. So you'll find pretty quickly that this snake will drag that squirrel under the creosote bush, where he's got at least some, some dappled shade. And it'll take him probably the better part of 10 minutes. And the video is edited a bit, so we're not going to watch him for that long. But you see how he, he swallows that squirrel a little bit at a time. Their jaws don't come unhinged, as people often say. They get all the, or most of the, the gape size there. 
from their mandibles not being attached. So the ends of their mandibles can separate widely. And then that skin under their chin and their throat is very stretchy. So within about 10 minutes, minutes or so of him finding his squirrel, he's got the squirrel down. And the meal's complete. So what about snakes in yards? Why do snakes show up in people's yards? Um, what are they doing? How do, can you avoid um, attracting snakes? Most snakes that show up in yards are males and they show up during the courtship season. Most of our, our rattlesnakes, uh, at least here in the Western US, um, mate in the spring and in late summer and fall. And the males spend a lot of time during those two periods wandering around looking for female rattlesnakes. So if you clean, keep a clean, tidy yard that doesn't have places for snakes to hide or for rodents to live, you're not likely to have a female hanging around because they like to stay where there's, there's resources like food, shelter, a place to thermoregulate and to stay just the right temperature when they're pregnant. And they're not going to be in your yard if you don't provide places for that. But the males during the courtship season wander all over the place. And more than females, the males show up in yards and on trails and other places where they encounter people and are often killed, sometimes bite. Um, and it's the males that are, are, are encountered mostly by people because of that activity to, uh, to find the females. This is just a cool, unusual photo. I've never seen one like it. It's from my first Mojave rattlesnake study in California. I don't think I mentioned I live in Tucson for the last several years and, and, and just rattlesnake uh, heaven if it wasn't for the drought. Anyway, back to the photo. This is a, a male actually in pursuit of a female. I've never seen this before, haven't seen it since, have not seen other photos like this. Usually the male is scent trailing a female or he's wandering from place to place where he knows females hang out. Um, we think maybe some of the, the limited movements that females make may be to leave a scent trail uh, for the males to pick up. This is a cording pair of rattlesnakes. These are sidewinders, one of our smaller species. Um, the female is the one that's not moving. The male is tongue flicking, his body's jerking a little bit, and you can see his tail wrapped under the female's tail. And you'll see some, some extra movement there right at the end of the clip. Um, when I'm um, collecting data in the field and I come across a courting pair of rattlesnakes, I, I always have a, a little pang of guilt when I, there's, there's him searching for her cloaca, trying to, to copulate with her. She's not cooperating yet. Um, and I always feel a little guilty when I, I check both snakes as, as uh, courting because often the female is has not participating at all. But on to the next slide. Rattlesnakes give birth to live uh, young. They do that once a year. Um, for Mojaves and Diamondbacks, Eastern Diamondbacks, litter size is about eight. Um, they're born in the late summer or fall. And the little guys are just um, little miniatures of the adults, pretty much in every way. Um, they're about the size of a pencil. And they've got that little uh, button on the end of the tail, and you'll see a closer look at one here in just a minute. We know now from a, a number of studies, mostly involving radio telemetry, and, and Melissa's and Jeff have done a lot of work on this and have some great videos on their website with Arizona black rattlesnakes. Um, we know that the kids stay with the females for about 10 days or so until they shed that outer layer of their skin for the first time. So. I'm going to show you a, a little video here shot with a camera that we can put down a burrow. Um, this is a Western rattlesnake female. You'll see a couple of her babies here in a second. She was in a burrow um, with a telemetered female. There's one of her kids going by, actually fleeing from me at the mouth of the burrow. Here comes one of the others. She was in this burrow. And we had never seen her before, uh, but she was with a, another female that had a radio in her. And the other female was also pregnant and had given birth before this one. 
and her kids had already shed and departed. And as soon as the kids depart, the female leaves. But this female gave birth several days later, so she's still in there. And what you see here at the end is, I hope you can see my cursor here. Um, this light colored shed skin here is one of the, the sheds from one of the first females, babies that are now gone. And this large discolored shed here is an old shed from adult, an adult snake that probably was before these females got in here to, to have their babies. But um, as soon as this female's kids shed their skins, um, all of them will leave and go hunt. Female are the kids for the first time and the female uh, probably hasn't eaten for a couple of months before she gave birth is pretty hungry and wants to feed before hibernation. As I mentioned, babies are just uh, miniatures of the adults. They're about the size of a fat pencil. Um, and you can think of that little hard button on the end of the tail as the eraser on, the pencil, on that pencil. No rattlesnake has a long tapered tail. Even if they only have one segment, or in the case of the babies, a button on the end of the tail, um, they still uh, don't have a long tapered tail like other snakes. Babies are, are small enough, they can't usually can't um, swallow something as large as a mouse. So the little guys often eat a lot of lizards, like this baby Mojave wolfing down a, uh, a gecko. And as I mentioned, the adults tend to eat rodents, although they'll also eat other things. They'll still eat lizards and they'll catch birds if they can catch them, um, et cetera. So let's get on to some of the myths. Um, Everybody's heard that baby rattlesnakes are more dangerous than adults. And as I mentioned, they're just little miniatures of the adults, but they're miniature in every way, including the size of the venom glands that produce and store the venom. They're just tiny. The venom glands are tiny in these tiny little snakes. Um, if we look at an adult and a, a several month old baby diamondback, you can see that the venom glands in the, the adult are probably as large as the entire head on the baby. The head on that baby snake is not much bigger than your thumbnail. And the venom glands are much smaller than that. So let's look at some actual venom collections from these two rattlesnakes. First, the big adult that weighs 1,200 grams is, is about two and a half, maybe pushing three pounds. Notice the double fang on one side there. Notice all the venom squirted in the bottom of the, that little 100 milliliter beaker. Now the baby. So people think when they say the babies are more dangerous than the adults, they tell me that they don't think the baby can has learned to regulate its venom like the adults do. But which one of these guys would you rather take a bite from? I mean, even if the baby unloads everything he's got, he doesn't have much, especially compared to the adult rattlesnakes. And there's lots of data to back that up. This is um, data from one of the largest uh, venom laboratories in the country that's been around, been doing, been extracting venom for research and anti-venom. Um, for decades. And their venom, like, like the other handful of venom laboratories in the country, tell us that the adult yield is about 100 times that of the, the yield from little juveniles. And we also have clinical data to back that up. Um, this is a graph from a paper that came out of Loma Linda University, uh, where they looked at 145 rattlesnake bites where witnesses were asked to estimate the snake size. And I've added inside the black bars there, the, uh, the inch values for the snakes. It was published, of course, in, in metrics at the bottom. But you can see that the snake bite severity for the medium and large snakes was not significantly different, but the average snake bite severity score for the medium and large snakes was almost double the average score for the little guys under 16 inches. And there's a more recent paper published in 2019 where some physicians tried to figure out, and they looked at almost 6,000 pit viper bites 
and tried to figure out what a ER doctor can look for when a patient walks through the door with a snake bite that might be a hint of a bad outcome or a, or a severe clinical course. And they came up with four things. One of them was large snake size. The bigger the snake, the more likely an ER doc is gonna have a patient that's got a severe envenomation. So let's go on to Mojave rattlesnakes, my favorite, as Melissa mentioned. Um, and there's just so much uh, misinformation out there about Mojaves. I eventually wrote the book, um, but I've already got two or three things that I would add to a, a revised copy and it's only been out a year. Um, and one of those I'll show you here in a minute. This is just a couple of the many, many examples that I've saved over the years. Um, on the left there, Mojave Greens um, packs a, an arsenal of venom many times more deadly than its relatives, including the Western Diamondback. The odd or, or sad thing about this is it came out of a Wisconsin paper. And if you search um, newspapers.com, you'll find mentions about Mojaves in papers, newspapers all over the country, not just in the Southwest where they occur. On the right is a newspaper clipping um, that kind of says it all. Snake experts in Arizona, not sure who that was, say that the snake that bit this little baby um, is a spine chilling combination of the coontail rattlesnake, almost certainly the Western diamondback with that nice black and white banded tail and the deadly Mojave green rattlesnake. And there's, there's a real um, underlying current in many of these stories that involves hybrids. And so let me talk just a bit about hybrids. Um, in the last 20 years or so, genetic analysis has become easier to do, less expensive, um, and more and more people have gotten into, more and more researchers have gotten into doing it. And a fair number of those are looking for rattlesnake hybrids. And while there are a handful, literally just a handful of individual hybrids that have been genetically verified, um, mostly in captivity, a few in the wild, there's only one place where a population of established hybrids between two species of rattlesnakes has been well, uh, well documented. And that's in Hidalgo County, New Mexico. And it's a very small area and it involves hybrids between Mojave rattlesnakes, Crotalus cutulatus on the left and prairie rattlesnakes, Crotalus cutulatus on the right. So why are they hybridizing with each other routinely when a lot of these investigators have looked for hybrids between Mojaves and Diamondbacks, which have a much more, uh, much larger shared range and, and found no, no population of, of hybrids. Well, if we look at how they're related, and this is a what we call a phylogenetic tree, and it traces back um, how long ago different species shared a common ancestor before they diverged and became two different species. And the Latin names on the right there, Crotalus atrox uh, is the Western diamondback, Crotalus cutulatus, the third one down is the Mojave, Crotalus viridis right under Scutulatus is the prairie rattlesnake, which we know that scutes and prairies are hybridizing in Hidalgo County, New Mexico. But if we look uh, to the left, you'll see that the common ancestor of the prairie rattlesnake and scutulatus out here um, occurred up till about 4 million years ago before the, the two lineages diverged and scutulatus became a species and, and this other one went on to be prairie rattlesnakes and the Western rattlesnakes. But if we look at Atrox, the Western diamondback, you see that the last time that Mojaves and Western diamondbacks shared a common ancestor was about eight and a half million years ago, twice as far back as when prairies and scutulatus or prairies and Mojaves shared a common ancestor, which is, is why, explains why Mojaves and diamondbacks can't apparently hybridize because they've just had too long for their, their genes and their chromosomes to become different to the point that they can't actually um, conceive a healthy um, offspring. Whereas 
prairies and, and Mojaves, much more recently, um, shared a common ancestor. And apparently, they haven't become different enough genetically that they can't still reproduce. So is Mojave really the deadliest rattlesnake, as so many people say? Well, that myth has a, a common, actually a, a legitimate origin, and it goes back um, actually about 90 years, but these are some of the more recent um, results where scientists started testing snake venoms in lab animals to see which ones were the most toxic. And the Mojave rattlesnake, at least once we figured out there was a venom A and a venom B, venom A being the neurotoxin that um, most Mojaves have, venom B being the non-neurotoxin, uh, some populations in central Arizona have venom much more like uh, diamondbacks where it, it uh, destroys tissue, but is not, not neurotoxic. But talking about the, the neurotoxic venoms, they have a much smaller, uh, what we call an LD50 value, which is the amount of venom it takes to kill half of the lab animals. Compare 0.15 to 0.2, 2.7, 4.5, et cetera. Same thing down here in Russell's book. Um, these are different means of administration, but still Mojave's have by far the smallest LD50 value, means it, meaning it takes less venom to kill the lab animal. So that was, of course, extrapolated to mean they're probably more lethal to people, but in fact, they're not. And this isn't the only example of animal studies that didn't translate well to humans. Here's just a few, um, some of the best reports that illustrate that. Uh, the first two are by Dave Hardy, and Dave was a Tucson physician who was a, also an accomplished herpetologist and was very interested in snake bite. The first study there was where Dave reported on 15 bites by Mojave rattlesnakes where he was actually able to um, personally ID the, the rattlesnake and verify the species. 15 bites between 75 and 82, no fatalities. Then he reports on 159 cases in the Tucson area between 1973 and 1980, where he estimates, he wasn't able to look at the snakes, but he estimates probably 60% were diamondback bites, about 30% Mojave bites, no fatalities. And more recently, um, my friend and, and colleague now, Dan Massey, and his collaborators reported on 516 snake bite cases in southeastern Arizona, where there are a lot of Mojaves, especially in Cochise County, um, and came up with one fatality. So here you have three studies that uh, total about uh, 600, almost 600 snake bites in an area that's full of Mojave rattlesnakes, which are undoubtedly responsible for a, a significant percentage of those bites, one fatality. And here's a map from Harry Parrish from 1980 um, and while this map is a little bit dated, we know from the CDC's morbidity and mortality reports that the distribution of, of snake bite deaths is pretty much unchanged over many decades. And now the average number of people that die from snake bites in the US is about five or six per year, spread out all across pretty much the southern tier of the United States. And if, if rattlesnake, I'm sorry, if Mojave rattlesnakes are so deadly, why are there only five or six fatalities spread out all across the Southern United States? And why are they not concentrated in that red area, which is where Mojave rattlesnakes occur? Mojaves just don't kill a lot of people. And finally, the, the last thing I wanted to mention is, I think Melissa kind of teased it in the, the uh, announcement for my talk about some, uh, some new uh, findings. Uh, just a few weeks ago, um, working on a project at the Poison Center here in Tucson, one of the guys at the Poison Center said, you know, we don't see respiratory paralysis from snake bites, even Mojave rattlesnake bites. Where did that come from? Where are the case studies that show that, that they cause respiratory paralysis? Because we see a lot of snake bites, we don't see respiratory paralysis. But here's just an example. And I, I picked this because it's, it's written by some of the, the biggest names in snake bite medicine um, in the last century. Uh, Sherman Minton, Henry Parrish, uh, Finley Russell. Um, and this is common. All of the 
the authors and clinicians that we all um, knew and respected, and myself included. It's in my book that's a year old. Um, everybody believed that Mojave rattlesnakes, the neurotoxic Mojave rattlesnakes, were capable of producing respiratory paralysis that was often delayed by several hours. Well, I started, after being questioned about it a few weeks ago, I started looking for, for cases. And I'm going to show you just a partial list of some of the cases that I came up with that suggest or, or flatly state that Mojave rattlesnakes can produce respiratory paralysis. And in all fairness, I threw one in there that the bottom left hand one there that I co-authored. As I say, I've, I've said the same thing to, to many, many audiences and, and written about it. Um, I ended up looking at 31 um, publication, medical publications that either said Mojave rattlesnakes cause respiratory paralysis, or they were references for the ones that said uh, uh, they just that were justifying the others that said that they caused respiratory paralysis. And we found only one, Jansen in 1992, a snake bite in Southern California, actually in Atalanto, um, that was the, the, um, the snake was verified as Mojave. And there's a great um, clinical description of respiratory muscle weakness, and the patient had to be intubated and mechanically ventilated. That's the only one, as far back as I can tell. So where did this whole thing get its start, that Mojave's caused respiratory paralysis? Well, it's a lot like the whole idea that, resp that Mojave's are the most deadly. It goes back to Tom Gibbons, who was doing some of those early animal studies Instead of mice back then, Givens was using cats and rabbits and pigeons and injecting lethal quantities of, of snake venom um, to see what, which venoms were more or less toxic compared to each other. And in the process, he was dissecting the dead animals and looking for what caused death. And he found changes in the nerves from the so-called neurotoxin of some of these snakes, including Mojave. And as he watched these animals die and then dissected them, he reports back in 1931 that with the neurotoxin paralysis results that finally progresses to the muscles of respiration. And when those are involved, death follows quickly. That was literally quoted by Lawrence Clover, who wrote the big two volume um, authoritative reference on rattlesnakes in 1956. Um, and it was quoted and requoted and expanded upon. Um, and everybody up to the present, almost everybody uh, who are bona fide experts in snake bite believe that Mojave's can cause respiratory paralysis. And unless we find something else, um, we've pretty much exhausted the literature and find one case. So let's quickly, let me just touch on aggressiveness. Um, as I said, rattlesnakes are pretty shy. These are just two of my telemetered animals that, uh, you know, if you stand still, pretty much ignore you. If you don't stand still, they'll, they'll flee. The one on the right, actually, um, you can see he's got a, looks like a, probably an antelope ground squirrel that he's recently eaten with the big lump in his belly. He actually came over and investigated my, my antenna as I'm knelt down taking uh, data. Here's a diamond back here in Southern Arizona that I couldn't find. Look, look, look for it. And finally looked down by my foot. And there she is an inch from my boot. She's not rattling. She's not doing anything. She's sitting still hoping that I don't discover her and bother her. And that's pretty typical rattlesnake behavior. Now, having said that, I should mention, like other animals, rattlesnakes have individual personalities. And some are pretty passive and some are, are pretty easily um, aroused. But for the most part, they're going to sit still, hope they're not discovered, flee if they have the opportunity to get into to a rodent burrow or, or under something that's nearby. And only as a last resort they, are they going to confront um, something the size of a person. So are baby rattlesnakes more dangerous? No. In fact, they're less dangerous. They have a lot less venom. Uh, if a big rattlesnake unloads on you, 
he's going to create a much more serious bite than a small rattlesnake that delivers much of its venom. Are Mojave greens the deadliest rattlesnake? No. They occasionally produce fatalities, but not very often. Uh, certainly not any more often than, than other uh, rattlesnakes. Do they produce respiratory paralysis? Almost no. We found one case, and we found a lot of, of uh, people that have treated a lot of snake bites that have never seen respiratory paralysis, even from Mojave. So it's extraordinarily rare. And finally, do they attack people? No. They, they try to avoid confrontations with us, and what people uh, perceive as attacks is usually a disturbed rattlesnake that's, that's huffing and puffing and rattling and, and doing its best to look um, dangerous and, and uh, scare off uh, whatever uh, antagonist, usually a person uh, that's bothering it. So I'm going to leave you with, with this video. This is um, a big northern Pacific rattlesnake that was telemetered. And I knelt down to, I'd, I saw him moving in the brush over there. So I knelt down some distance away so I didn't bother him to collect data. And here he comes. So when I see him coming, I pulled my phone out and I start recording. And darn if he doesn't crawl right up to me. And now he smells something here. Remember, they, they gather chemical cues with their tongue. And he crawled over something that really got his attention. So he stops and he's, I say sniffing. Um, although I do believe they, they, or, or they, they do sniff with their, their nostrils a bit, but the, the collection um, mechanism that they depend on is that moist tongue. So he's sniffing around there within about 10 or 12 inches of my right knee. And eventually here, he looks up at me and decides that he doesn't want to investigate me any further and continues on his way. These guys are unaggressive. If you, if you don't frighten them or, or antagonize them, certainly not step on them or accidentally touch them. Watch where you put your hands and feet, especially at night. Um, they're not going to bother you. So with that, I think... Um, by well, golly, it's 10.45. I'm amazed that I nailed that on the nose, but I'd be happy to take uh, any questions that anyone has. I'm yeah, sorry. that was that was great, Mike. Thank you. Those videos are wonderful. I love the little dude at the end coming up to investigate you. I've had that happen a couple times doing radio telemetry or um, just, yeah seeing one around and stopping to whatever, take data. And then it's like, oh, they're, they're chasing me. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I, uh, I actually published a, a little piece, and I think it was the second biology of the rattlesnakes about uh, my original study where um, I really believe that when you're going out and, and visiting the snake every day or two, I think the individuals that get used to seeing you start to be acclimated and be less frightened. And I think we see more natural behavior instead of defensive behavior. They, they, it comes to the point they kind of ignore you. Yeah, that, that has been our experience too. And on a, um, a broader scale, and this kind of touches on a, another rattlesnake myth a little bit is um, places where snakes and people encounter each other a lot, but it's also a place like a park or just a friendly like house um, where the snakes aren't persecuted that they also seem to just you know be a lot more chill like they hardly ever rattle um, they tend to learn where they can sit that isn't like you know right in your way um, yeah. which is kind of opposite of the the myth that's like starting to replace the dangerous baby one is the one yeah. I get asked about a most the most which is aren't aren't rattlesnakes stopping rattling because people kill the ones that rattle and there's just, um, I've yet to find any evidence of that. I think you could do similar sort of literature review <laughs> as the paralysis yeah. thing. And there's just, um, nothing out there except for, you know, stories of people just, you know, in the newspaper or whatever saying like, yeah, I heard. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I like to tell people too, you know, the, especially the, the widely distributed rattlesnakes like diamondbacks and mojaves and sidewinders and, and such. Um, and back east, you know, um, the timber rattlesnake especially, although it's, of course, threatened in many of its places. But out west here, 
a lot of these rattlesnakes have enormous ranges and the vast majority of them never encounter a person. So the effect that um, people have on the periphery of those ranges uh, where they do come in contact with people and people kill the ones that rattle, um, the idea that people are gonna have a big enough effect on the population in general to actually produce a change, a genetic change in the snakes or not rattling, um, it's just kind of contrary to the whole natural selection um, idea. There, there's, there's too many of them that, that never encounter a human that pass on the, the same genes they've had for rattling for a long time. Yep, yep, yeah. And far as we know, it still works as a yeah. deterrent to pretty much every other animal. <laughs> yeah. Um, Cool. So um, one question that we had come in um, before we got started, and then I'm going to check on YouTube to see if there's any questions there. And for those of you watching live, please put your questions there. And if you're watching the recording, obviously we won't be able to answer your question now, but we will continue monitoring the comments and I will get answers for you if you're watching this later. Um, but and this is this is a question that I get a ton or like a lot of snake questions. It is given to me as a statement um, <laughs> yep. here in New Mexico. Um, is there any indication that Mojaves are expanding their geographic range anywhere on the periphery? And I guess along with that, or are they contracting? No, I think that Mojaves in particular are a little bit, well, and Diamondbacks for that matter, um, you know, really adapt pretty well uh, until they're killed to being around people because people often um, provide what they need in terms of shelter and food. Um, and, you know, their ranges are, are pretty stable. What is interesting um, is that in the hybrid zone where the Mojaves and prairies are hybridizing, the hybrids have the Mojave toxin, the, the neurotoxin from the Mojave rattlesnake, but the neurotoxin doesn't seem to be spreading away from the hybrid zone into the, the prairie rattlesnake population. And the pra prairie rattlesnakes um, tissue destruction uh, portions of the venom are not spreading into the Mojave population away from the hybrid zone. So no, it, it, their, their ranges are stable. Um, we don't see any indication that, that they're expanding or contracting. Cool. Yeah, that was my, my feeling as well. And I'll just, I'll put it out there. And I know you've put out this call for the whole aggressive rattlesnakes, rattlesnake chasing yeah. people. Most of us always have a, a camera and a video camera in our pocket, these devil, devil tools. Um, and so, yeah, if you see something that you think is a Mojave in a place where it shouldn't be, you know, take a picture, send it to Mike, send it to us. Um, I know in New Mexico, like Game and Fish is really interested if they are expanding their range, like we'd, we would love to see it and New Mexico Game and Fish would love to see it. So for sure, like send us a picture. Um, yeah, so we can or, we can confirm it. Yeah, and, and you can uh, upload them to iNaturalist or, or Hurt Mapper. Um, yep. A bunch of us um, constantly look at Western Diamondback and Mojave uh, observations on iNaturalist because all too often they're misidentified and uh, <laughs> several thousand there's thousands of them on there now and we're always we're always looking for the outlier the one that that's outside the range whoa is that really Mojave and you go out there and nope it's something else um, so yeah you're right we're always looking for the the new place but so far uh, it hasn't happened yeah, Mojaves and prairies and diamondbacks do look similar enough, um, and and some black-tailed rattlesnakes. That yeah. is, that's actually who I've most often heard misidentified as a Mojave, especially black-tailed rattlesnakes at lower elevations because they do tend to be, well, as green as a Mojave. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but. Yeah, that yeah, that is a good idea. That iNaturalist is another good place to go. You can get a lot of people's input in case you think we're just biased against the idea of Mojaves um, mm -hmm. spreading around. So I'm not seeing any other questions. Um, we do have a couple comments on YouTube that this was great information and lovely photos, um, and also just again, uh, besides the 
cool video at the end. Just the videos were wonderful. The Ninja Rat, if you haven't seen more of those are super fun. Um, and yeah, those are, those are some great feeding videos and stuff too. Thank you for sharing those with us. Sure. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't see any other questions. There's a bit of a delay always on this, but, um, but yeah, I mean, we don't have to stay the, the full hour if there aren't any more questions, if you didn't have any, anything else, we will be sure to pop up the, the link to check out the book. Um, yeah. And thank you so much for doing this. Um, uh, my pleasure. I really enjoyed it. And yeah, like I said, you know, if you're watching this recording, um, cause I know a lot of people can't make it live is always the case then put your questions in the, in the comments and we will get them to Mike. Um, and yeah, so there's some other comments that it was really interesting to see how the venom is taken, which, yeah, I agree. I've, I've given that little spiel about, um, you know, it's like venom is stored and produced in the head. And so babies have a much much, much smaller heads than adults, but yeah. it was really nice to see those graphics go along with it and to actually see the amount of venom when somebody's trying to, um, you know, get as much out of them as possible. The babies just, they just, they just don't hardly have any. Yeah. Um, yeah. And some comments about Mojave, Mojave greens or Mojave's, um, just being beautiful. And it's, it's really cool to get to see them because yeah, it seems like who's always making an appearance everywhere are diamondbacks and timber rattlesnakes since those are the most common ones and that this has been a great way to expand your knowledge of of snakes for someone just starting to get out there and learn about snakes so glad we That's could cool. help you out with that maddie but yeah um thank you everybody for coming and thanks so much, Mike, for doing this. Um, my pleasure, Melissa. Yeah. So, yeah. Have a great day, everybody. And, um, yeah, thanks for joining us on Snakes or Everything. I, I should mention that for change, like, I actually have a, a bit of a teaser for some upcoming talks that we're still setting dates for. But we are going to have um, someone talk all about moving nuisance snakes um out of yards and long distance movements and short distance which there have been questions about on some other episodes we're going to have a whole talk on that um someone who's going to talk about using social media to teach stuff about snakes um and so i'm <laughs> I personally we're interested in that we're not the ones giving the talk we actually are going to have somebody else come in and i think we're going to have a whole talk on understanding the private lives of snakes coming up real soon too. Um, so yeah, thank you all so much. And, um,